Okay, I'm talking about end-to-end -end performance. Before I start, I want to get a quick overview because I've, I have been here a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in the room was at my presentation back then, like two or three years ago. So I want to know who of you are just front-end developers? Just a few hands. Who is doing only back-end? Okay, who is doing everything? Perfect. Who does not do anything at all and is just here for the free pizza? <laughs> That's fair, right? So eat enough because it's $5 and drink some beer. Um, the reason why I'm here, so I work for, it's hard to miss, a company called Dynatrace. I'm not going to give you a product pitch because that's not why we're here for. But what I want to tell you is why I'm actually here. And the reason why I'm here is because in the last 15 years, hard to believe I'm that old, even though when I'm freshly shaved, typically people say, did you just come freshly out of college? So I, I started my career in the performance field with a company called Segway Software. I'm not sure if people remember that company. We built load testing tools back then and functional testing tools. I started as a tester, became a developer, became a product manager, and then I became uh, the guy who helped our customers back then to run huge load tests against their applications, break them, and then tell them everything is broken, now you're on your own. Um, which was great. Uh, we after Segway, we became Borland, so maybe that's a company that m also a lot of people know. Um, we got acquired. I stayed with these two companies for seven years. And after these seven years, I was kind of tired of breaking applications, but not being able to tell them why these applications break. Because that's the problem with the load testing tool. You break something, you look at the CPU statistics and network bandwidth and all that stuff, but that's about it. That's when I joined my colleague, who was the CTO back then at Segway, because he found that a company called Dynatrace. And he said, we want to solve the problem by sitting in the application itself, and if it's under load, we want to tell our customers why it's slow and where it's breaking. So I joined him and he said, Andy, please you know, go ahead and help the clients because not everybody is a performance expert. So please help them figure it out, you know, show them how to use the tool. And the cool thing with that is on the first thing, it gives me a lot of gratification when I can help people with their problems. Like you said, you worked on Black Friday, right, back there. So I, basically, we also helped a lot of people to have you know, a relaxing day on Black Friday, or at least as relaxing as possible. Uh, so I started with Dynatrace. Dynatrace later became CompuWare. Three years ago, we got acquired by CompuWare. That's maybe a name that people also know in the industry. And now we are actually back to Dynatrace. So we got uh, bought again by another investor, and they said, we love the product so much. We love the whole performance management stuff that you do. Let's go back to the original name. So just in case. You wonder what all these names are. It's always about performance. And what I'm typically doing in these talks when I'm here, I'm not going to tell more about my history, but I want to basically give you the best practices that I've collected over the years. Why websites fail, why they go down, and how you can avoid it. Who of you knew uh, one product that Sergey was already mentioning, the Dynatrace HX edition? Does anybody know one awesome product? So uh, those of you that don't know it are probably the people that don't know that there used to be a time when there was a browser that was called Internet Explorer. It's ancient history, but it used to be the number one browser out there in the world. And Microsoft did a really crappy job in producing tools. There was no tools at all that did give any performance insight. So what one of our engineers who actually worked on our product, on which did Java, .NET, and PHP server-side performance analysis said, I have no time, I have time left on the weekend. So I will just take this cool server-side technology and build something for the browser. So what actually happened is that we built a tool called the Dynatrace HX Edition. And you can see we got some nice endorsements from John Resick and also from Steve Souders. I hope these are two people that you are familiar with. John Resick is the guy who created jQuery. Steve Souders is the guy who we have to thank because he started the whole web performance optimization movement. So HX Edition was back then, and it was a great tool. It's still there, um, so you can download it and use it for your IE and Firefox diagnostics. And uh, it's still a great product, even though now, obviously, other tools have, have caught up, especially, I'm sure, who is using a Mac here? Probably most of you, right? Unfortunately, it not, doesn't run on Mac, because there's, fortunately, uh, these browsers that you use there have own their own um, great tools that come with the product, with the, with the browsers. And it seems, for whatever reason, my slides are actually moving all along on their own. Anyway, what, they, um, what the um, diagnostics uh, tool 
what Dana Grilich Expedition tried to solve or solved was the problem that Steve Souders pointed out. He said, most of the time in a web performance or in, in an, on a website is, is spent on the front end. And so don't think about the back end, do everything on the front end. That's what he said, and optimize everything because you want to optimize end user experience. And there have been a lot of tools out there, as I said before, PageSpeed, SpeedTracer, Wiselow, all of these tools were built to focus exactly on what Steve said back then. However, what I can tell you from my experience, it's great if you optimize your front-end performance, if your landing pages are super fast, but if you are then implementing, who is in the e-commerce space, for instance? E-commerce, yeah, one, two, couple. When people go to the checkout process and do the credit card checks and all that stuff, you cannot s uh, speed that up with fancy JavaScript and optimizing JavaScript rendering. So that's why what I say, it's obviously web performance is about front-end optimization, but it's also about back-end optimization. What you see here, I know it's a little hard to read maybe, but e these are some real-life examples of one of our customers that had their own web applications. And some of these requests take 60 seconds, 133 seconds, and the reason for it is not because it's slow on the front end. It's slow because of back-end reasons. And that's why I want to raise the awareness here that please follow all the stuff that Steve Souter said, but also listen to people like me because there's more to user experience than what happens in JavaScript and CSS. So in this case, extreme example, 99.9% .9 happening on the back end. Doesn't matter if you're optimizing your JavaScript framework. The last thing on the tool front before I go into my presentation, so for those that know the AGX edition, and also for those that don't know it, uh, today we released the next version. So Dynatrace AGX edition 4.5 is now available to download. But as I said before, this tool was only doing front-end development, and we, have a, we are a strongly believer that you also need to go into back-end. And that's why we also have an offering now, a free offering, which I am responsible for spreading the word that you can now also download Dynatrace, and you can register for it which is the full end-to-end -end product where you can do everything for free on java.net, PHP, uh, any type of web application. You can download everything on hx.dynatrace.com. So this is the last pitch that I do on the tools. Because now I want to go back to why we're here for today. The reason why we're here for is because nobody wants this. Nobody wants Apple going down unless you're Microsoft or Google, right? If you go to their website, to their store, this is something that you typically don't want. Nor do we want to have something like this. If you're a mobile developer, who is, mobile de who is doing mobile app development? Okay. You don't want something like this to happen. The FIFA World Cup app, two days before the FIFA World Cup, the soccer World Cup, that they play with the foot, it's called football in Europe, crashed most of the time for most users two days before the tournament started, which is the biggest thing that can happen to Europeans. It's awesome. And so this was obviously something that you don't want to want to have because why don't you want to have this? Because it leads to things like this. This looks like a party, but it's not really a party. It's a war room scenario. This is a picture from Facebook in 2012 when their website went down because too many people tried to post too many funny images of cats or told too many people how often they go to the loo. I don't know what they did, but anyway, Facebook went down and if Facebook goes down, that's obviously their lifeline. They don't make money because people don't click on the ads. Who has been in a war room before? Yeah. The only good thing is that you also get pizza, but I think it's more fun if we get pizza here and not in an environment like a war room. Potentially, the whole thing leads to this, making it to the news. The FIFA World Cup app, app made it to the Daily Telegraph, British newspaper, and uh, Facebook also made it famous into some of the online news when it went down, or every time when it goes down, it makes it to the news. And this is obviously something that we want to avoid. Nobody wants to work for a company and sees this in the news. It also leads to things like this. It leads to bad user ratings, especially if you have a mobile app that you put on the App Store and you want people to use. If you get bad ratings like this, everything that is highlighted in red here, Basically, people complaining about crashes and how crappy the app is, and they are a football fan, they want to see the results of their team, and they cannot do it. How can this happen? Nobody will download this app anymore. And if you're providing software as a service, it's the same thing, right? If you have Spotify and have something else to choose from, I know Spotify is great, but still, you know, not what you want. 
And also, business doesn't like some these, these things either. These things either. The reason why is because of this. This is a statistic that tells us that um, it is 150 times more expensive to find the problem or fix it once it's out in production. These are also not new numbers, but just to realize and to tell us the earlier we fix the problem, the most the, the, the cheaper it is. Also, 80% of development time is spent in bug fixing. And um, I used to be a developer for a long, long time, and I'm not sure about you, but bug fixing is the m not the most interesting thing that I can do as a developer. I'm not sure how about you. It's more like building new cool stuff. The next number that I will show you is something that doesn't come from an official study, but it comes from my gut feeling, because I work with a lot of companies and I help them to analyze why their websites, why their applications are slow, and I often see that 80% of all these problems are only caused by about 20% of problem patterns. It's always the same reason. When people download our software, when they download the HX edition or the Dynatrace tool, they typically come back to me with the same type of issues. And that's what kind of fascinates me, even after so many years of having these meetups. This is the reason now why I want to show you the top five situations, why what I've seen in the field, uh, and why this happened and how to avoid it. And before I continue, I just want to do one thing, because I think I know why my, out my, my uh, slides actually advance even without me noticing, because yesterday I did a similar meetup and I recorded the click timings. And so I just want to make sure that the replay doesn't use my timings that I had set yesterday, because otherwise I have to speed up at certain points in time and it doesn't make sense. And I hope I, um, I, hope I can do this right here. I hope this click here made it. Let's see, I hope. So five situations, real life situations where I either I worked on that project myself because I was the development manager or customers. And every time when I started a, a, a scenario, I always try to find a picture that explains it, like Sergey did with his head down. The first one is something that I want to I want to give you a second to read it and to take it in. So this is probably a room full of C-level executive management people, and there's the one guy in the front who pays the bill, and he says, we need to have a mobile strategy. Right? Obviously, we all need to have a mobile strategy if we're in software business and we want to sell products through mobile devices, and the guy in the back who is checking his Facebook status all the time, or listening to Spotify, at some point in time realizes, sorry, did you say something? Oh yeah, we need to have oh, a mobile strategy, of course. Typically what happens if things are rushed through rather quickly because management puts a lot of pressure on us is something like this. It's a push without having a real plan. The first example is an example that I really like because the marketing idea beho behind the whole thing was, was brilliant. This year at the Super Bowl, I'm not sure if people still remember, 2014, February, who won? Seahawks, okay. Who remembers the, m the commercials? Uh, not really. Huh? Doritos, okay. So this one was a main sponsor. It was a soft drink company. One of the big ones, not Coca-Cola. Maybe the other one. So they had the brilliant... Hmm? They had the brilliant idea, which I really liked. So they said, there's going to be millions of people watching the Super Bowl at home with a, at, at, a, at a party. So why not let them take selfies of their party? So I would be standing here and taking a selfie of all of us, uploading it to their website, and then when people with their mobile device go to the website, we show the last 400 uploads in a 20 by 20 grid. So it's cool if you have a screen like this. You see 20 by 20. If it's on a screen like this, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Especially if you look at these numbers. The total size of the mobile landing page of a company that is probably exactly the one that you named before had 20 megabytes, and in total, 434 images on it. So it was the 20 by 20, the 400 plus 34, the company logo, some sponsors, and all that stuff. And the interesting thing is, these images are really tiny here on my screen. I had to download them in the original size. That's why it's, two, it's 20 megabytes. So my phone sat there for five minutes downloading the 20 megabytes, and then the, the, the tiny little processor in here, it's an iPhone 4, 
had to work to scale down all these images to fit on this little screen. This is not a mobile strategy. A mobile, it's a great marketing idea, but if marketing comes up with an idea like this, please implement it in a better way or let them know that, I'm not sure if this is the right thing. Now consider the one thing. I mean, I'm traveling a lot throughout the world. This is my business phone, my Austrian business phone. When I travel to the US, I pay data roaming fees. 10 euros per megabyte. So fortunately, I was at home in Austria at this time. But if I travel to the States, I need to explain my boss why I just downloaded 20 megabytes, which is, uh, which is 200 euros, which is about $300, to try to get access to a page that doesn't tell me anything. Okay? Doesn't make sense, at least not to me. Maybe to you, but not to me. Is anybody from marketing here? Please raise your hand. We don't throw stones on you. We just want to tell you that don't do things like that. Next example is an e-commerce store, and I didn't give the name and I won't tell it. Uh, this was last year uh, at, uh, on Black Friday. Their mobile strategy was we need to have a mobile domain, m.store.com. And what they did, you went to m.store.com, you got the HTML, all the images, the JavaScript files, everything was, was correctly included with m.store.com slash image1, image2, image3. But every image request got redirected to the original www.store.com slash image1, image2. That means for all the 150 images, for the 50 JavaScript files, and for the 20 CSS, my phone had to do two round trips. Hmm? Yeah, all of them. Everything was redirected to the original domain. The only thing that they did, they said we want to have an m.store.com domain. So when people come in with a user agent string, like an I, an, um, you know, a mobile safari, so you can see that all 302s, everything. This is just, par, uh, just the first part of it. So in total, they had 150 images on there, the product catalog, like the top 150 products, and all that stuff. This is also not a mobile strategy, just getting a mobile domain. Last example, coming back to my, uh, I, I, I'm really a football fan. I'm both American and European, but I really like the European football. The FIFA World Cup, uh, or FIFA, not only had a mobile app, but also a mobile website. And what was interesting on their mobile website, they had a FAV icon, a favorite icon with 370 kilobytes. Right, the FAV icon is the normal, the little icon that you get on the top left of your browser, or when you pin it to your home screen, 370 kilobytes on a mobile website. Why? Because it was a huge icon that was on there. It was like, I don't know, screen resolution. Somebody just, somebody got the, somebody was probably tasked, we need a FAV icon, and probably got the company logo of FIFA and just put it on there. And no, I didn't think about the size of it. So what I'm saying is, I know we all laugh about this, and we all think this is, makes total sense, right? We would never do this. But I'm pretty sure these guys that built these web applications, they're also not stupid, but sometimes things just are forgotten, or somebody pushes something through. They, they don't know all the stuff about what Steve Souter said. So please take this into consideration the next time when you build something, when you deploy something. It should not happen. Also, what I always try to do with all of these examples, I want to give you some metrics that hopefully are known by you, but just, again, let them th sink in. You should always look at the number of images that you have on the page. Remember the soft drink example, the number of redirects and also the size of your resources. If you look at these before you check in code, when you do your testing, when you go into production and deploy, if you always do a sanity check first, these things should not happen. Next example, and I told you I'm always trying to find an image that kind of reflects what I'm going to say. In this case, what do we see? Inventors, it's right. <laughs> Reinventing the wheel, right? By, hmm? Latency too. I would say calling this reinventing the wheel with existing components, with other components. Sometimes, you know, we in, in engineering, we should reuse components that proved well. Like, I don't need to write my own OR mapper all the time. If it's already there, I don't, I know I don't need to rewrite jQuery every time because it's already there and proven. 
Sometimes, however, what happens is that engineers, and I'm picking on engineers now, are often blindly reusing existing components. And what that means is the following. I, um, this is an example from my own world. I told you, I'm not, I think I mentioned it, I'm responsible for getting the free Dynatrace tools to you. So I took over the job of making sure that everybody knows about our free products and that I can not only tell you now and you go to our website afterwards, but I can also invite you. So if you give me your business card later on, I can go home, sit at my hotel and send you an invitation. When I took over that job, I said to my engineers, I want to have a report. So if I invite somebody, I want to have a report that tells me which people did I invite and what is their status in the free trial process. Did they get the email? Did they click on the uh, activation link and all that stuff that we have in the process? The guy that I tasked with this task that I asked to do this was a backend developer and he was only implementing web services so far. He implemented all the web services that handle the registration process, that's sending out the emails. He has never written a web application in his life before. But I told him I need this report and I need it right away. So I pushed him. What he did, well, let's say, ask you the question, what would you do if you are tasked for new stuff that you've never done before but you don't want to admit it and you want to get started? What's the best thing you can do? Go exactly, Google it, copy something. So, hmm? Stack Overflow, exactly. So that's what he did. He Googled, he found something, he found a sample application on GitHub that showed him how to create a web report out of two database tables because we had two database tables where all the data was in there. He took the sample app, he converted it to his needs, and I got my nice little report. This is my report that shows me which people I've invited, I'm the inviter, which status they're in. So three people that I've invited, this was early this year, and it worked super fast. I, I, I didn't need to look nice, this is just a report that I need. Um, it was super fast. In the beginning, when I took over the project, we had 50 people in the whole database. And every month, every week, every month, it, this repo became slower and slower and slower until in August, I called him and I said, it takes over a minute now to get the report that shows me three individual lines. I cannot use this report anymore. So he said, I don't know what I did. So what we did, obviously there's no fancy JavaScript here that could be optimized, right? Everything was in the database. And what we did, fortunately, we own our own products that can actually, we use our own products that can analyze performance issues like this. So the next screen, what you see, we looked at all the database statements that were executed to generate that report. So these are individual, so two select statements, and they were called in total 4,000 times. The guy, my engineer, he never wrote a single line of SQL because he used the sample app that used Hibernate. Where Hibernate is a great framework, but if you don't use it correctly, then something like this happened. In his case, the way he implemented the code, he said, Hibernate, give me all the free trial members and I will iterate through all the objects in a loop. And for those objects where the, in the inviter is Andy, I'll put them in my own little array and then at the end I'll render out the HTML report. So basically, every single free trial member in the database got loaded. Not only those that I invited, but everything got loaded into memory. And the more database statements, the more people we had on the free trial, the more database statements were executed, and therefore the whole repo took much longer. The thing what I'm saying, what I want to say here is, if you're reusing components and they're shielding off the complexity of getting into a database, please still sit down and look behind the scenes in how these components internally work. Because for Hibernate, Hibernate is a great framework, and there's other OR mappers out there as well but you can configure them. There's different fetching strategies. You can, you can tell Hibernate how to fetch objects. If you only need the object that Andy invited, there's a switch, there's a configuration element where you can say, only give me those. And then Hibernate will only execute one SQL statement and return all the data that you need. But this was an interesting aha moment. So 4,000 statements in this case. So the key metrics that I think you should look at if you do, if you analyze the performance, look at the number of SQL executions that you have and also the number of same SQLs. Why do I say same SQL statements? Because iterating through the lists, this is the typical n plus one query problem pattern. So you say, give me, it's like one select statement, give me all the IDs of all my free trial members and then for every single ID, you have an individual select statement. That's the n plus one. And if you look at these metrics, then you, and you, 
do your own testing, and then you see, ah, interesting, just executing a thousand database statements. Maybe not that good. Make sense? Next example. Um, what does this tell us? Beautiful house. An architect that made, that designed the nicest house, but the first storm that came through blew it away. So probably he made some architectural decisions that were not that well. So what I'm, what I call this architectural decisions gone bad. And in this case, I have to again point at myself. Um, we are using Confluence for our online and public community website. Confluence is known from Atlassian, yeah. So it's a great product for collaboration. You know, you can it's Jira as well for ticketing, yeah. So we use both systems, but Confluence we use for our community portal. This was our community portal, can try at least the header that we had early last year. We had 53,000 people on it. So every, every Dynatrace Ajax Edition user, every user of our free or commercial products get access to the system. And I'm responsible for it. And I got complaints from users. They said, well, Andy, there's a lot of great content on there. But first of all, your website looks like 2010. I cannot use it on my iPhone because it looks crappy and it's super slow. And if I post something on your forum and you answer it, I never get a notification about it. So no social features. I said, fair enough. We are on a version that is two years old. We never upgraded. So it's time to upgrade and give the whole thing a facelifting. And before we upgraded, we also looked at the release notes. So it's an off the shelf product, Atlassian, uh, Confluence. And it said, the latest version, support for mobile end devices, social interaction features, optimized perform huge performance improvements. So we thought, awesome. So we upgraded and also gave it a little facelifting. So this is what we wanted to look like. Before we upgraded, what we did, because we didn't have a staging environment back then, because we thought it's an off-the-shelf product, we can just upgrade it and everything will be fine. Before we did though, just to get a little bit, at least a sense of how the system behaves, we ran a load test. So we are, I'm, I have a load testing background and we also have a load testing product in our company. So what we did, we ran a load test with 200 concurrent users, so the blue line starts from zero and over the course of two hours we ramp it up to about 200. And the other metric that we looked at were the number of requests executed for these simulated users. So we knew from our production monitoring that the typical user on our community goes to the homepage, clicks on login, clicks on a search or does a search and then clicks on a documentation. So four pages. We simulated these four pages and found out that these four pages cause about 200 round trips. Download the HTML, the JavaScript files, all normal. We didn't have a staging environment, so we, saw, we thought nothing will go wrong, but just to be safe, we do the upgrade on the weekend, on a Sunday, run another load test and in case something goes wrong, we still have the Sunday evening to roll back. So we did the whole thing, we ran the load test, and unfortunately, we had to abort the load test after only like about an hour into the thing, only with like 20% uh, of the users because the whole system crashed. And the single key metric that told us what the reason was, was the number of requests per users now. So for the same four pages, instead of executing 200, we now had 400 requests coming in, 400 HTTP requests coming in for the same number of users for the same four actions. And the reason being is, first of all, we made the biggest mistake ever. We did never, we did never ask Atlassian how to best do an upgrade and what we can do on a performance improvement or uh, how we do a correct deployment. So the, the way we deployed the new software was without having any JavaScript files merged. They added about 25 jQuery plugins. They were all deployed as an individual file. Okay, a lot of CSS files individually, so we just deployed it in a way that was not meant to be deployed in production. And the second thing that happened, they had a lot of new social features like these pop-up boxes telling me when I log in how many new notifications I have. All of these things executed additional Ajax calls. And these are basically causing twice as many requests for the same number of users on our web server which could not handle the load. The hardware was just not specced for it. So what we did, we spent a long Sunday night to roll everything back, then sat down with Atlassian and figured out how to correctly deploy it and which features we actually need on which page because we didn't need to turn on everything, all the bells and whistles. Make sense? It's 
Yeah, it should be known. So basically, the, the metrics that we need to look at is the items per page or the number of images, the number of resources per page. And also, because obviously, I, I'm sure you build a lot of one uh, single page web applications nowadays and you do a lot of HX calls, XHR calls, you want to also figure out how many calls you really do. You know, this is really then you're pounding the server all the time. Next scenario. And again, I'm, I'm sure this is fake. At least I hope it's fake. But what this tells us, if I am the guy who operates the train, so I came down from Boston today with the Acela. Uh, so if I would be the operator, I would be scared. Uh, I would assume a certain environment. But in this case, it's we should not assume. You cannot always assume how the environment looks like. And can you can I please have another raise of hands? Who is doing mobile development? So. Mobile native as well, yeah. The example that I'm going to show you now is from the number one sports tracking app in Europe. The company is called Runtastic. I know they also enter the US market, but I think, I'm not sure if they are that big in the US, but they're called Runtastic, and it's a sports tracking app that you can take with you, and then you run, and you bike, and you do whatever, and it tracks basically what you did. And at the end, you can click on the little brag to my friends button, so load it up on Facebook and tell the people what great job you just did. What's interesting with these apps, the reason why people are very loyal to the apps and don't move from one app to the other is because when the longer you use it, the more history you have and you get more features you can enable, like where did I rent last week? What is my average speed? How can I improve? So people stay with the app, but if something happens, they actually complain. They actually pick up the phone and call them or at least send an SD email or write something bad on Twitter. In this case now, this was one user that complained. And what this shows here, this is the, uh, the GPS map or the, the location of the track that he, that he biked. So he biked, and from top to bottom, this is a, an area that's uh, 10 kilometers, so six miles. And he, he biked, and, but the individual markers here are actually 20 kilometer markers, so 12 miles. So Runtastic told him after an hour, he just biked with his road bike 480 kilometers. That's 300 miles per hour on a road bike. That's, I don't think, really possible. But if so, I would definitely like to tell the world about it. But this guy said, Rantastic, as much as I love your product, I, I, cannot, I don't want to make a fool of myself in front of all my friends if I post this on Facebook. What the engineers from Rantastic said, well, you know, we, we are doing all these tests as possible. We have all the iPhones, we have, we have the major Android uh, devices in our test lab, and we've never seen this before. But we assume it has something to do with the distance calculation between the GPS locations we take on a regular basis. So why not, instead of testing it only in-house, why not take the unit test that we already have into the production system? So what they did, they implemented a test that was executed on every single device out there whenever the application started. And at the beginning, they tested the calculation of two well-known coordinates. So it was a unit test that tested what's the difference between these two GPS locations. It should be one kilometer. If it's not one kilometer, we know we have a system, we have an, a device on hand that cannot correctly calculate that distance. And therefore, it's probably device related. That's what they did. So what they did, they had a mobile monitoring strategy, so they used our product to, mo to monitor every single end user. And what you can see here is we call them user actions. So this is when they went in the starting the main app and then logging into Facebook. And then in the one of the very beginning, one of the first steps, they, they do this unit test. And in case the unit test fails, they report back GPS location failed to, to bring us the right result. And they also report back uh, OS version, uh, Android version, I mean, uh, hardware, um, device, uh, carrier, and all that stuff. And what they found out is that it only happened on certain Android versions on certain devices. And then they did a little Google search and found out it's a well-known GPS location bug in Android that is deployed by certain hardware vendors. So there's nothing they could do about it, right? They could not fix this. But what they could do, and this is where marketing comes in again, they said, if we find a problem that we cannot control because it's an unknown environment, we can at least use Twitter and let our end users know and say, if you are on this app, we are sorry. If you're on this OS version, if you're on that Android, we are sorry you may experience problems. Also what they put in into their app 
uh, in, in like an info screen, like you know, known, known issues when it pops up and says, we, th we are on, on a version that may, uh, may experience some problems. Okay, so this is a smart idea, putting the unit test into the end user devices. So if you are a mobile developer, if you ever consider doing this, it's a, a, a cool thing to do. The other problem that they always had, and I think this is true for every, most of the web mobile applications we have right now, same is true for Meetup, you can log in with your Facebook account and not create yet another login. And what they often had is people complaining about their app, how slow it is to upload something to Facebook. Right? They work out and at the end, the app crashes when they like to upload it to Facebook. So what they said, well, what we need to do, we need to figure out, out is it us or is it Facebook that has a problem? So what they also did, they built in monitoring into the mobile app of how fast or slow it is to call these third-party apps like Facebook. And then when they, this is their production monitoring, and when they see, hey, Facebook has a certain issue at a certain particular point in time, their marketing department or customer relationship department can go on Twitter and say, guys, we know a lot of you are experiencing problems with our app right now, but it's actually not us, it is Facebook. So please be patient. Please don't upload it right now, but maybe in an hour when Facebook is back to normal operations. This is how this should all work out. Right? So the, uh, the metrics that I want to teach you is if you do mobile development or also for actually for any type of web development, you want to you wanna capture functional errors in your app, like what they did with the unit test, and also third-party calls, monitor them uh, for, from, for regular you know, web apps. Fortunately, we now get better and better support from our uh, browsers itself with the W3C navigation and resource timings. Um, but um, there's a lot of RAM solutions out there, uh, real user monitoring solutions that can do this already, uh, even without relying on these, on these new browsers. Next example. Who, who does not know who this guy is? Okay, so you, you, you have never watched Game of Thrones? Okay. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so basically the thing is, I'm, I'm a... I love Game of Thrones, but I guess I'm one of the few people in the world that has not yet seen the season four, because I'm one of the few guys that actually waits until it's available on iTunes, because I'm, I'm living in Europe and we don't have HBO, and I'm actually refusing to download something that it's not, you know, I wanna buy, I wanna pay for it. But this guy, you don't know him, but re trust me, when you see the show, you wanna slap his face every time you see him. And he got basically on the throne, so somebody put him, deployed him on the throne to do more evil, and what I call this thing is now deployment gone bad. Somebody made a very bad deployment. Uh, the example is from an e-commerce customer, and I know there's some in, in here. So they came to me and said, um, well, this is how our system looked like in testing. So what they had, they had the regular e-commerce store, but what they also had, and they allowed basically certain vendors to put um, to put products on their on their uh, on, on their shopping or in the product catalog, and then these vendors, like business to business wise, they got a report, so they could go log on to their administration portal of that website of that e-commerce store and say, how many products have we sold through your store, and that report in testing they tested the whole thing. So this is an end-to-end -end visualization of uh, of uh, of our product. So they they executed some load, and this report took 42 seconds. And what was already al alarming for me when they showed me this number, that they were executing 1,614 database statements for creating a single report. I wasn't involved at this point in time, but they showed me these numbers later on, and I said, why didn't you, pull the, 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 why didn't you stop the whole project? Because they said, we were two days before, before Black Friday, we couldn't do anything anymore. And then we also said, well, 42 seconds is kind of acceptable. It's for only for our B2B customers, so they can wait a little longer. It's not, that, it's not like our end users that buy products. They said, okay, we, 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 we sign off and we put this to production. When they put the whole thing in production, this report was eight times slower, so instead of 42 seconds, it took 5.5 minutes, and they executed 5,200 database statements. And this blew off their system. So individual Business-to-business -business consumers, so the, 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 the sellers of these products, they basically brought down their e-commerce store. So the question was what, was, the, what was the difference? I mean, this is already bad enough, but what's the significant difference here? 
Who wants to take a guess? Number one, correct, bigger data set. So first of all, not testing with the real environment. No browser refresh, no? No? You got tired of waiting. No, what happened is, so what they also did besides looking at this, the first thing that typically I look at when I analyze end-to-end -end performance, I look into which we call this logical layers of the application. On the server side, we look at things like, is it the database layer, is it the business logic layer, is it, what is it? And in the test environment, they saw most of the time spent on the web server in I.O. That's totally normal, because most of the stuff that you do on your web application is delivering static content, which is images, JavaScript files. It's all I.O. Comparing the same thing to production was interesting, because now, and this is a little hard to read, but it's Hibernate. Hibernate was number one. The second thing is Java class loading, so this was a Java shop then custom monkey and XML parsing, XML libraries. So something significantly has changed. And the thing that has really changed and that showed them what the problem was, was the next screen. Because what we tell them, or we, what we can tell them is which methods were actually consuming most of the time. And the number one contributor was get interfaces of Java line class. So those of you that know Java, it's Java reflection. So Java reflection was the number one contributor. And then this uh, view here, we call this the method breakdown but it's the reverse call tree. So who called this? And it was called by a class from Hibernate, the field interception helper. So Hibernate, for whatever reason, made extremely many calls to reflection. What they did, they went on Google, searched for field interception helper, found out there's a well-known bug in that version that they had deployed in production, but not in testing. So they had two different versions of Hibernate deployed, that's why they didn't find this problem in testing. So yeah, too many, uh, one. Well, the thing is, the build tool is the same, but the people that deployed the app just deployed a different version. They, they applied patches before they put everything because on Black Friday, they wanted to make sure they are on the latest version of everything. And they unfortunately deployed a version that just recently was in had, had a bug introduction. That's what happened. And they, in testing, they didn't test it with this environment. And production, they upgrade to the new version. Yeah. It, I know. I know. It's, it is bad. And I, I agree. And these are things that I want. That's why I want to tell you. We all know about this. Uh, hopefully, at least most of you say, of course. Yes. I know this. I would never do this. But obviously, this happens a lot. And it typically also happens if people in pre-prod and prod don't talk with each other using different settings. I have, I, have, I have a lot of horror stories about deployments gone bad. I can tell you this. This is just one of them. So, But they, with, a, with a simple Google search, they could figure out they are on a version that has a problem. They applied the patch that was already available, and everything was good. But the other thing was also, who said that and the database was bigger? You said that, right? So the number of statements in there, that's true, because they also didn't test against the same volume of data. So what I'm always telling, what I always look at, which the metrics, time spent in APIs, I call this, uh, this logical layers like Hibernate and Spring and Web Server and Database Tier. These are logical layers for me. And there's tools out there that then break it down into layers instead of going into every method first and also the number of calls into these APIs. That always also gives an indication, are you using these APIs correctly, yes or no? Do I make one web service call in the background or 500? I'm coming to my last example. And I like this a lot because it's, uh, it goes also in the area of not, not now Black Friday, but Super Bowl. Um, and I also had this other Super Bowl example in the beginning, if you remember, with the, the selfie thing. Who remembers the Kia commercial? Does anybody remember Kia? They were main sponsor. They had a real cool commercial. It was uh, Godzilla chasing these cars through, I guess it was New York or some city. And it was a Hollywood production. There was Lawrence Fishbone, I think is his name, Hollywood actors playing in that, in that clip. The clip was 90 seconds long and 90 seconds uh, uh, time on the air is $12 million. Okay, that's how much it costs. So do we have any marketing people in the room? No. Sales people in the room. 
We do. I know, I know you are. Why would we spend, why would a company spend $12 million in, in a Super Bowl ad? Why? What's the main objective? Revenue. Why? Because? Make money because they want to drive people what they want. Everybody that drinks beer and doing the Super Bowl, they ah, Kia.com. Cool car, I buy it now. So they, what they basically want, they want to drive people to their website to see how awesome cars they have to sell. And this is probably one of the peaks peak times, right? What well, it was what Black Friday and Cyber Monday was for you, this was Super Bowl for them. At least in the US. So what happened was something that I call they didn't really have an agile deployment. And what I mean with this is the following. Um, we not only do deep dive diagnostics as we call it, so end to end from browser into the database, but what we also do is uh, availability monitoring and uh, and response time monitoring. Similar to what our the main sponsors of this web performance group do, like Sosta and what was the other one? Catch point, just to name them. So we also have a solution like that. And for every big event, like the Super Bowl, the Olympics, the FIFA World Cup, we always monitor these websites that sponsor. Because we want to know if something goes wrong, because then we can stand here and talk about it. And what you will see in a second is a graph that shows the availability of their website during the Super Bowl. The availability was 100%. The ad went on air, dropped down to zero. After the Super Bowl, it went up again. That means they spent $12 million for this ad, and m a lot of people only got, cannot connect to this website, website down. Not seeing how many great cars they sell. Reason being, they had a total overloaded page. They had like videos on their high res, ev everything was super overloaded, and it was just, their site was crashing. I'm sure they used CDNs, not sure if they used Akamai or not, who is also a sponsor, but um, they just, they failed. But I don't only want to bash on people that did bad. Of course, we can learn from it, but I also want to show you a good example. And the good example was GoDaddy. What GoDaddy did was the following. was very interesting. So this is not the availability, but this was the response time of GoDaddy. This was about an average of 1.5 seconds until one hour before the Super Bowl. One hour before the Super Bowl, we observed that the response time improved by 4x. And we, the first thing we saw, we thought, when we saw this number, we thought, well, probably they already crashed, and the only thing they show is a funny little HTTP 400 error, right? That's what we thought. We went online and saw something very surprising. What their marketing team said, if we spend millions of dollars in a Super Bowl ad, we want to tell the people what we sell, and not how many friends of them like us, how many people on LinkedIn like us, how many tweets we had about it, so they basically built a trimmed down version of their website that they turned on on demand one hour before the Super Bowl. They were 100% available. They were four times faster than before. And at the end of the Super Bowl, they flipped back the switch to normal speed. This is the way you need to do this, right? If you have a peak period coming up, this is the way you, are, you should develop your software. Obviously, it not only takes, you know, it takes a lot of engineering power to do this, a lot of testing power that needs to be tested when you, when you flip the switch so that you don't lose people on the old version and then on the new, but uh, this is the way you want to do it. And the key thing, as I told you, is they, they basically cut off the whole third party Chrome around it. Everything that was not really their main business, they just cut off. And uh, so the, the key metric that we could observe that dropped significantly was the number of domains, of third party domains. They really only put it down to the bare minimum. And also the total size therefore reduced quite a lot. Why? Well, because they're, 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 they're nicer. Who, who asked that? Okay, why did they flip back? Because they're, they're, their normal website looked much nicer, obviously, and had a lot of features in there, but they could not sustain the load, the peak load on that website. So these were a couple of examples that I showed you. And these were all the metrics. So please, what I want you to do, I want you to pick a metric, or two maybe, and take it home with you. And before you check in some code, check this metric, if it has changed from before you change the code or after. If you are a tester, take this metric from the old build and the new build that you got. If you are responsible for operations, you look at this metric before you deploy a new version and after it. 
Because what we can do, if we not only do it manually, but also automatically, then I think the world we should live in, and I'm taking now the number of SQL executions. I take this now as an example. If you have a delivery pipeline, which I'm sure you have, I don't want to ask you now how automated that is, but let's assume it's at least there. And so I'm sure you have a commit stage. So uh, you as a developer, you can use all these free tools available to check these metrics. So the number of SQL statements, when I change a code, before I check it in, I checked it, I did the number of SQL statements change now. If you are running your unit tests and integration tests in your CI environment, why not also check these metrics additionally to the functionality? Because the unit and, func and integration tests, they check, they check the functionality of your code. Why not look behind the scenes? And obviously, if we play this game forward, you can do this in every stage. And if you look at these metrics in the different phases and automatically monitor them, and chart them over time, and you see an increase of one of these metrics from one build to the next, you know something significantly has changed, which should actually stop the whole pipeline. So that you don't deploy something in production or deploy something in testing and somebody needs to run, run a, a one-day load test on it and then tells you something that you would have known anyway. So this is the whole idea of how I think we can revolutionize or evolution. Uh, it's either the evolution of web performance optimization or we can revolutionize it by, I know, Sergey, we talked in the beginning, you said in the beginning, you're only looking at front-end performance, which is great because you can also do this on the front-end performance metrics, the number of images, the number of JavaScript files. But I believe if we do it end-to-end -end for the whole application, then we are actually getting even better. And uh, yeah, one thing that I want to offer, because I am uh, I'm in the um, lucky situation to not only have free tools that I can tell you about, but I also got time from my management to not only give the tool to talk here, but also give you advice on your own application. So what I have started is what we call performance clinics, or I call them performance clinic. And the performance clinic works in a way that if you use tools like Wiselow, PageSpeed, or maybe Dynatrace, you're probably not the expert right from day number one. You don't know what data you're looking at if you're not dealing with performance every day. But I look at this, da this data every day. So what I offer people that download our free products, I offer them to send me the data and I take a look at it. And there's two examples of, of stuff that came in last week. The first one is an example from, uh, they were called knockoutcasino.com. It's an online casino. And the guy came to me and he said, I downloaded your, your browser diagnostics tool, but I have no clue what this tells me. I'm not a, a software engineer, I'm the guy who's responsible to run this in operations. And I am afraid that I am going to be here on Sunday night because this thing goes down. So he, sh he sent me the data and I could tell him the easy things that I know by heart, right? Page size, number of objects, all of these objects, 282 images that they had on the, on the landing page. They all came from one domain. Doesn't make sense. You need to spread them out because otherwise you're delay loading everything or everything is, is, is staggered. Um, so this is stuff that I could tell him. He's not a performance expert now, but I could help him. And I have a story to tell you now. So that means if you send me some data, I'm not giving your name, but he allowed me to use the name, um, then I have something next year to come back and tell you about the typical performance problems I saw in 2015. And the second example, this was one from a, uh, uh, also a, a report. So it was a guy with a Java application and he said, hey, the report is, ran I mean, I, I'm, I'm a tester. I have, I have no clue about Tomcat. We're using Tomcat. I have no clue about it. Never seen it before. I'm just testing it. But it takes very long. And the data that I saw, not only how long the report took, but they had one SQL statement running very long. And they used a version of Log4j, which is a common Java logging framework. First of all, they had debug log mode turned on in, in load testing and also probably would have gone into production. And they had a version where uh, the appenders were synced. So they have multi-threads multi going on and they were all syncing. Uh, that means they spend a lot of time in sync, synchronization. And they also spend a lot of time in rendering. They used uh, the AWT, I don't know which rendering, that was a report framework that is based on AWT and that was just not used properly. That's why these reports that should take a second or two took 500 seconds. And I gave him this, this report and he took this and went to the engineers and said, I'm sure you can figure this out. And now the engineers are using this product as well on the day-to-day -day basis. 
So what I wanted to offer you in case anybody's interested in it, if you want to get started, um, first of all, every other week I do an online version of the whole thing. So you can go to bit.ly online perf clinic. So I show how, how I do my sanity checks and I teach you. They're also going to be recorded and put on YouTube. So if you don't have time every other week. Uh, and I also have another thing which is called Share Your Pure Path. This is exactly the thing. So if you use our product or any other product, you can, you can go to bit.ly share pure path and then you can send me the, um, your data. And the, your benefit is you get the free performance review from me unless a thousand people start to do this every day now, which I doubt, but hopefully some. And I also give an extended license if you want to go beyond what we give you in our, in our free version. And my benefit is I have more stories for blogs because I do not only stand here and talk, but I also have a blog where I write about this in all detail. And also obviously gives me a lot of gratification to help people. This is really good. Because I know how hard it is and it took me years to get there. Um, yeah. And now I want to open it up for questions. And that's just a reminder. This is the where you can get our tools, hx.dynatrace.com. My email, if you want to contact me, if you want to follow me, not stalk me, just follow. And also the blog. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah? So first of all, I want I don't I didn't want to say Hibernate is bad. Hibernate is good, but if you use it wrong, that that's a problem. What we see an awful lot, and I'm not sure how many friends of Microsoft are in here. Who is doing Microsoft development? Nobody try. Nobody. Come on, you can. It's not too bad. Here we go. What we see a lot actually is applications built on the share on SharePoint. I've seen very horrible things being done on SharePoint. Uh, because people don't know what SharePoint really is about, and they misuse it for things. Um, but uh, you know, it's um, it's also the .NET entity frameworks so on the Microsoft side again. On Java, it's really most of the time I have to say uh, Hibernate that we see, because it is just the very popular uh, OR mapping tool out there. Yeah. It's a very good point. Um, well, it typically, what, what you should do in the beginning before you decide on using something existent or building something new, you want to do dedicate time for your research, right? If you know you need something that, needs, that needs to sustain a certain load and needs to support a certain environment, then take the time and build a prototype and build a test environment that tests the whole thing out. And then you figure out, is this something yes or no? And if it's not, then you have projections that go on in this direction. Like I know you're building a new website, a new service, and if this is going through the roof, then you want to actually already test for, is this framework, are these frameworks actually able to also help me in a year or two? But then there's always the decision, well, I cannot invent three months to build something new from scratch, so maybe I have to go with this solution now. But I have to think ahead and not wait until it's too late to start with the new thing. So it, it is really hard. But I think what people typically don't do, they don't take the time and sit down and look at these frameworks and build and put them into a comparable environment and figure out if they really work for them or not. No, but they, so, so, okay, the question was what did GoDaddy do and, and whether they did it with horizontal scaling? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I didn't work with the engineering team, so I, I don't know, but what I would assume for the short period of time, for the two, four hours, 
they probably said, hey, we want to make sure that nothing happens to us. And the safe option is to really bring it down to the bare minimum, which is we want to tell people that you know, we, can, uh, we can scale. And the, the thing, w one thing with GoDaddy and with, with all the other examples, the problem is if they would have run the full website, even beautifully horizontally scaled, who is the one, or what, during a Super Bowl, if all the providers are including Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, these are the third-party services that get hit the most. So it means it is actually a smart thing to say, maybe we get rid of it, because even if we scale perfectly, we still have an impact. There's actually a cool service out there that's called Outage Analyzer, outageanalyzer.com, that shows you which third-party services are currently down and not available in which geographical regions and which uh, pages it impacts. So it's based on the, the synthetic data that we have, but we make this f uh, free available outage analyzer. Outage, like outage and analyzer. If I have five more minutes and if people are interested, but only if I'm interested, I could have five minutes of your time on a, on a live demo, but if not, I, because I don't want to force something on you. So who wants to show me, like really I only spend five minutes, hands up, yeah? I think that's the majority. Okay. And then, you know, if, if more questions come, uh, then let me know. So I need to go to duplicate here. And now I can finally sit down on this cozy chair. And by the way, if you like these stickers, I got some stickers for you because we should spread the word that Dynatrix is an awesome product. And if you don't know where to download this free trial stuff, I also have some. Because I told you, I told my boss, spread the word that we have a free new tool available. So what I have here is a lot of open windows, boy. Choo, choo, choo. Where is my, here is my Dynatrace. So um, what I have in my environment is I have a sample application running on my machine. And the sample application is called Easy Travel. And Easy Travel is a travel portal. Uh, it's built on uh, uh, Java Tomcat, so two, two Java Tomcat servers. There is a C++ component, there's, an uh, there's a database behind it, and the front end is a mixture of IceFaces and jQuery, and uh, we also embed some third-party components. But it's basically a travel portal. Why do we use this? Because people typically know what travel portals do. So what, what I'm, who wants to play guinea pig? Sergey, you are playing guinea pig, okay? You are the developer of Easy Travel, and you just deployed this new build for me, and I'm the tester, okay? I'm testing the use case scenario of booking a, a journey to the most beautiful city in the world, which is my hometown, which is Linz, L-I-N-C, so I'm entering these keys, and you can see here that if I do things, then it's like HX calls going on, and then I click Linz, and uh, it's in Austria, and if I click on search, you can see we have palm trees all over the place, no mountains, no snow, nothing. It's just white palm trees. So I book a, a trip for 199 That's awesome. That's a very cheap price. So I need to log in. And I'm using a pre-configure. I, I know a, a user in the database, Monica, Monica. I click on login. And I wait and wait and wait. And then I think, Sergey, what did you do? So I start opening in the side, normally opening up my Jira. And I start typing in my... Step one was this, step two, log in, everything is slow, then I make a screenshot and, and, and add it to the ticket. If I would be a real user of this production environment, I would probably now go to hotels.com or whatever other platform. So, but I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a tester and I take my job seriously, so I click through all the scenarios and I enter my credit card information and I do this with this little click and everything is pre-populated, which is awesome. Click on next and click on finish. And then I am done, and I say, I send to you the Jira ticket. And you get the Jira ticket, and what do you do? You took the pictures, exactly, at the nice ladies, yeah? <laughs> and what else do you do? Are you happy because you just got another bug ticket? Probably not. Yeah. First of all, you curse me. Another bug. No. But probably, if you actually take the time to reproduce it, most often it says, it works on my machine. Right? Typical scenario. So it worked on your machine, so you probably ping it or put it back to me. What I can do, though, because I have Dynatrace running uh, on that system, 
And what Dynatrace does for me, it, it analyzes everything end to end from the browser, every single interaction. And the, what you see here, this visualization is what we call the transaction flow. Uh, I'm sure people know other similar products in a similar field like App Dynamics, New Relic is probably something that people know. So similar visualization, the only difference is that this is built out of tracing every single individual web request down to the method level and we don't sample. So App Dynamics and New Relic do a great job as well, but they were just built for production only, meaning they don't want to capture every detail. We capture every detail because we think you are the one that should decide whether you need every detail or not. So um, I could now analyze everything that's on my system, but what I really want, I want to search my user Monica. So there's a little search button up here, and I want to search for Monica because that's the username that I used. I searched for it, and I found the reason why I find four, because my test system, I also ha I have some built-in load generator, so I'm running also load test in the back. But the one user, the last one here, Monica, it's hard to see. Monica from 127.001, my local IP address, using an IE10. Yes, I know I'm using an ancient browser, but I still like it. And what you have on the bottom here, automatically recorded, are all the steps that I did. So I loaded the page, clicked uh, precast, uh, key press L, I, N, Z, then hit a backspace because I showed you the HX dropdown. Then I pressed Z again, then I clicked on lints, clicked on search, click on book now and all that stuff. And at the click on login, I actually really had to wait 22 seconds in my browser. So this is the time that we measure in the browser. And what's also interesting is this column here shows me how much time of this was actually spent on the server. So the whole time was actually spent on the server. That means, Sergey, to your case, when we had the discussion in, in the beginning, if you optimize your JavaScript, it doesn't give you a whole lot. But um, yeah, I exactly. Well, I was frustrated, right? Frustrated, yeah. Not happy when I did this. So, but the cool thing now is, and this is our technology, you can now drill down, and we call our core technology Pure Path. That's also why I called the program Share Your Pure Path with me. If you share this data with me, I give you, I walk through this, and then I, I pick the things that, that catches my eye, and then I send you back what I see in there. So, if I now click on Share, uh, on, on Drill Down to Pure Path, I now see the click on Login. It took 22 seconds in the browser. So it, was the, it was a jQuery action. And then the cool thing is I can now drill into the server side. This is the beauty of the product. So I can now drill in and see what's going on. So I can drill down and if I, if I visualize, I can either drill down in the tree or I can always go back to what we call the transaction flow. So I can now see this was the user came in through the browser over Apache, first Java tier, second Java tier into the database and also make an external web service call. And the key problem, I'm not sure if you can read it from the back, the key problem is immediately visible here. Sergey, when I log in, you're executing 1,414 database statements, or 18. And then you said, I'm just a front-end developer. That's not me. Then you can point the finger to him because he's the back-end developer. And then you can, then, yeah, of course it was him, right? Well, who else? Uh, and then you can go and can say, well, which database statements were actually called? So show database calls. And now you can see, I know it's a little hard probably with the, with the, with the screen resolution, but there were in total six different statements executed. And this one here, call verify location, just store procedure, was called 888 times in total 13 seconds. And the second one was called 525 times. And if you want to know where this statement is called from, you can again right click, drill down to what we call the pure path. So back to the pure path. And now this pure path shows me where this is actually called. And here I can see it was actually called from Hibernate, execute native, and it was called from the authenticate internal method that whoever implemented that called. So this is the level of detail you get. And if you export that, and if I send this to you and you forward it to the backend developer, there's no discussion anymore about reproducing the problem because it's the, the proof is here. And the beauty is, so you can use this on your local machine when you do your sanity checks. You can use it in your CI environment to capture all these metrics that I told you about. You don't need to manually go through all of this, but we automatically show you nice graphs and alert in case something is wrong. And a lot of our customers also use this in production for real production monitoring. And I think some of them might be in the room. Yeah, question. Performance, perfect, is always the first question. And you will get the same answer that probably everybody gives you if you ask 
the other competitors are us. First of all, it depends, right? It depends on how much detail you want to have. But typically, with this level of detail, what we see with our customers, and yesterday I was in Boston and we had Enanoc in the room, which is a, 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 um, an energy business. So they have, I think he said, several million transactions per day. They said not noticeable in production, but typically what they get is between 2 and 3% overhead. And the overhead means that we what we add to the, the response time. So if the response time takes normally like a second, now it takes one second and three milliseconds, uh, and 30, 30 milliseconds, so something like this. It's very, it's almost not noticeable. No, all, everything. You want to have it all everywhere because the reason is you don't know where a problem hits you, right? If you have a distributed system where components talk with each other, you want to have it. If you have a load balance system and you're unlucky and you always pick the wrong one, what, does, what good does it do? If you have a bad deployment of hibernate on one of your machines but not the others because you didn't follow the real procedures. So yes, we have customers very close to here, that run this on several thousand JVMs. So may, may, maybe the first, and uh, repeat what you said. So you are from a customer, JPMC, and you said between one and two percent overhead. JPMC, yep. Yep. Cool. That's and great. then you are back. Your question back to him. Sorry. We have the agent on one of the servers, and uh, we only put it on one of the boxes because it does significantly affect performance. So that box that has it has a less ratio, twenty percent than a normal box would because it does add a lot of overhead, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of detail here. I'm surprised that it does the two, two to three percent on that. So if you don't believe me, I hope you believe our customers. And what this also tells me, the reason probably why you chose the competitive product, it looked very shiny and sexy. No, everything that is shiny and sexy doesn't need to be the best thing. And I'll leave it with that. It also does some other cool things. So automatically, once you have one of these agents deployed on your machine, you automatically get uh, system monitoring. Right? You get automatically everything from your CPU memory disk, network utilization, in your JVMs, in your CLRs, in your app servers, in your web servers. You get all the memory diagnostics. You can actually create memory snapshots from here, figuring out which objects are still on the heap, why there's garbage collection kicking all the time, what's going on. So I know I took more than five minutes, so that's why I'm stopping because I don't want this to make this a uh, presentation. Just a reminder: if you wanna contact me, then this is where you. This is how you can contact me.